since we are on our uh, journey to do tshuva, it's not only important to learn the halakha, the approach, the methods. It's also important to take stories from the past and to learn from them morals. So yesterday we learned about Rabbi Lazar ben Dordaya. Very important story. Today I want to share with you a very powerful story which I a few times uh, talked about it. Uh, but a very, very general without too many details. I would like to share with you the story today. The story is uh, told in one of the books of a great tzaddik that is called the Megalea Mukot. That's not his name. His name is Nathan, Nathan Shapiro. But he's known as the Megalea Mukot. Why is he called Megalea Mukot? Because one of his famous books that is called Megalea Mukot, which means reveals the depths. Eh? This special rabbi, I don't think many people really understand his greatness, but like I said, his name is Rabbi Natan Nata Shapi, Natan, Nata Shapiro. He lived uh, in Poland, in Krakow. He was the chief rabbi, the uh, head rabbi of the city of Krakow, which at the time was the oasis of the Torah. He was born in the 1584, died in 1633. So we're looking here about 400 years ago. And I don't want to go too much in length about the Megalea Mukot. You can look, uh, look him up. I can tell you just a few uh, key points about him that you know. And I highly recommend, by the way, to learn from his Torah. He has the, a book. It's called Megalea Mukot ala Torah. <laughs> Gems that you can't even fathom. So, as I said, he was the Av Beidin, the chief rabbi of the Beidin of Krakow. He was such a unique individual that on the verse... Va'et Hanan, on Parashat Va'et Hanan, six words. He wrote 252 explanations on six words from the Torah. 252 perushim, just for the verse Va'et Hanan el, Adon, el Hashem. You know that in the book of Va'ikra, the first word of the book, Va'ikra, the Aleph is a small Aleph, right? Aleph Zira. He wrote... The Sifri says he wrote a thousand explanations why the Aleph is small. Because Aleph, when you write it in different punctuations, is Elif. Elif is a thousand. He wrote a thousand explanations why the Aleph is, wrong, is small. Mine that we can't even fathom. Okay, enough said about him. And you know, by the way, I shouldn't say much about him. He specifically and deliberately did not want to be praised for everything, anything that he did. Humble in the Tachlit Habitul. He was so humble. He didn't want anything to be advertised. Who he was. What was going on. So I'm just going to say a few words about him. But nevertheless. There is a story. Of course happened about 400 plus years ago. That when I heard the story the first time. There's no words to really describe. I, I, the, the, the chills. I usually don't get emotional so fast. But this Caught, got me to become very emotional, uh, a little bit of tears, and uh, I heard the story maybe 15 years after I became observant, and that's when I figured out that what, what was I doing for the last 15 years? Thinking that I did tshuva? <laughs> not tshuva, I was wearing a suit and a yarmulke and a beard. But nevertheless, I want to share with you the story because it's a powerful story with an amazing moral especially now that we're learning about Shuva, we need to know the story. So the story goes as follows, and uh, I don't know if there's any translation in English, but I would recommend you to read it. I'm going to give you the highlights of the story and go very quickly, because if not, we're going to be here for three hours. Amen. So the story is talking about two orphans. One of them, one of them became orphaned when he was three years old, and the other one uh, was also neglected by his parents. And a uh, 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 butcher, uh, who was a uh, owner of, a, of a, like a meat store, he took them, these two boys. One of them was his nephew, and the other one he just found on the street, and he took him with him. And he was a very mean individual, this butcher. And he really put them to slavery. And uh, throughout the day, they would scrub the floor, wash the store, work hard, physically hard, little kids. 
And at night, they were delivery boys. He would deliver all the meat to the people who bought the meat and they would carry heavy pieces of meat. They were little kids. And it says that sometimes they would carry parcels that are heavier than them. And he was so mean to them, he didn't pay them. They would always be dirty, barely wearing any clothes, barely gave them anything to eat. Not human conditions, really, really torturing them. Child slavery. They were really, really uh, 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 having a hard time. One day, they walk in the street. One of them finds a coin on the floor. Oh. Takes the coin, and the first thing that comes up to his mind, I'm going to buy something to eat. And when they're starving, he barely gave him any food. He says, I'm going to buy something to eat. He didn't tell his friend yet nothing. But then he had a brilliant idea. He says, you know what? I'm not going to buy myself something to eat with this coin. I'm going to go to the other side of town. There's a market there. I'm going to buy some meat from the non-Jews for a much lower price than what this guy is selling his meat. And I'm going to sell it to one of his customers. And with whatever I have uh, left, I'll buy myself something to eat. Okay. Now, at the time, he didn't tell his uh, friend, the other orphan, what was going on. He, when he asked him, where do you have this from? No, no, I, uh, I found it. Okay. At some point, after a few weeks, what did he do? He had some money. Because <laughs> he went and bought a piece of meat or whatever amount of meat. Of course, it was not kosher. It was a fraction of the price. And he went and sold it to somebody, being the delivery boy of the butcher. Everybody knew. And, then, and he sold it for a profit. And then, of course, he had a little bit more money. So what do you do? You, you go and buy some more. And then you sell some more. And then, of course, at some point, the other orphan, they, they were best friends. And, of course, became partners. He told them, listen, I uh, stumbled ago, uh, uh, upon a gold mine. And he told him what happened. And they went partners. So after a while of doing this, then the first orphan, who was not related to the butcher, told his partner, we need to somehow get fired. One of us needs to somehow get fired. Okay, so let's make some act that we behave in a very inappropriate way and hopefully one of us will get fired. And that's what happened. They started a fight, an argument, whatever. And the uncle, what he did, he fired not his nephew, the other one. Which of course gave him an excuse to say, oh, now I don't work for you anymore. I work for myself. Now what did he do? He started advertising that uh, they somehow got a little bit of money and he's opening his own butcher store. Now he had two things going for him. First of all, he knew all the clientele. Second of all, <laughs> he would buy not kosher meat in the market of the non-Jews for a fraction of the price, sell it half the price of what the first butcher do, and make a very hefty income. And of course, everybody wanted to buy from him because it was half price. And nobody in their right mind thought that he's getting his meat from the other side of town. They were like, okay, the guy works for years for so-and-so. He's trustworthy. And as the time went by, they became bigger and bigger and bigger. At some point, they bought like a whole warehouse Nobody ever questioned them. Where do you get your meat? There wasn't star K, OK, Badat Saida, Haredit. There wasn't such a thing then. Certifications. They're going on by reputation. So they had a big warehouse. They would go and bring the meat from the other side of town, from the non Jews, bring it to their warehouse, wrap it, and they made a bunch of money. A lot, a lot of money. And as the years went by, they became multimillionaires, multimillionaires in the city of Krakow. They were like the most richest people in, in the city. All on the back of selling unkosher meat to the entire city of Krakow. Can you imagine how much people they made sin? Now, and the time went by, and business was blooming, everything was growing. They already got uh, married, got kids, married off their kids. 
And there were, you know, a big story, a success story in Krakow. These two orphans that became multi-multi-millionaires had beautiful houses, bought houses to their kids. Anyways, as the time go by, one of them married off his daughter. And, uh, you know, it, uh, like in any Jewish uh, community, it's a big honor that you marry off your daughter to a Talmid Chacham, to a, a great individual in the Torah. So one time he married off his daughter to a great Talmid, a great student. And one night he walks by and he hears his son-in-law learning Torah. Put his ear like this, he says, I want to hear what he says. And he starts hearing the son-in-law chanting the following. A person who eats meat that is a trefa, a dead animal or a wounded animal that of course is not a kosher meat. Chayav karet is obligated in a punishment of karet. Ooh. Suddenly, ooh, some chills goes in his body. What? A person eats an uh, unkosher piece of meat, meaning that the antrefa means that the animal was wounded before it was slaughtered. Chayav karet. Ooh, he didn't like the sound of that. Now he hears the son law saying, Efshar la so tshuva, you can do tshuva. Ach im lo, nechrat me'olam. Oh, again, chills. Translation for the ones of you who are looking at me like, excuse me? You can do tshuva for that, but if you don't, your soul gets cut off from its existence. Now he says, if shar tshuva, you can do tshuva im b'shogeg, if you did it by mistake. Ve'im b'mezid, en tshuva, no tshuva. Lokam bet chiyat ha-metim doesn't get resurrected in the resurrection of the dead. En lo chelik lo olam haba. Mezid deliberately, knowing, I know exactly what I'm doing. Lokam bet chiyat ha-metim doesn't get resurrected at the resurrection of the dead. En lo chelik lo olam haba, loses his olam haba. And not only did he lose his olam haba, where is he going to be? He's going to be hanging out in Kafakela. Kafakela, the worst punishment anybody can go through. He says, Genom kale vehemenam. Genom is closed. They closed Genom already. They don't. Can you imagine Genom going out of business? Tachav Mashiach is coming. They closed Genom. That's it. We're finished with it. And he's reading. Genom is going to be shut down, but they're going to still be in Kafakela. He got so shocked to the core, he didn't know what to do. He's hearing his son-in-law saying, a person who eats, not sells, eats basar trefa, unkosher meat. If it's by mistake, he didn't know, okay, still correct, by the way, but he can do tshuva. If it's bemezid, knowingly, intentionally, you can't do tshuva. No place to the world to come. You're not going to get resurrected. And more than that, you're going to be punished in Kafakela? And then he says, I've been feeding nevelot vetrefot, dead animals and wooden animals to thousands, thousands of people for the last 20, 30 years. If a person who eats it, that's the result, how about the person who supplies it? That hit a nerve that he became so sick, nobody knew what happened to him. He couldn't talk. Uh, he started stuttering. He fell down and became sick to the core. He couldn't believe. He's like, what did I do? Now, he didn't tell anything to his uh, partner yet. But nobody knew what's going on with this guy. Why did he become so sick suddenly? At some point, he took his friend and he told him, you know why I'm sick? I'll tell you why I'm sick. Because I just heard that we are in big trouble. And of course, he shared with him the knowledge, which affected his partner tremendously. Now what do we do? What do we do? So they decide to go to the chief rabbi of the city. 
the Megale Amukot. And they go to him and they start telling him what's going on. Now at the time, in the period of time, the Megale Amukot made everybody fast before they came to him. He made all these tikkunim, all these prayers. Why? Because everybody was dying in the city. Bachure Yeshivot, students of Yeshivot were dying. Kids were dying. Everybody was dying like a plague. They didn't understand why everybody's dying here. So the Av Beidin, the chief rabbi, started making all these prayers, community prayers, community fasts. And suddenly these two guys come and tell him, you, you know, uh, uh, th this is what we were doing for the last 20, 30 years. We'd be feeding the entire city. And the business was so big. It was already expanded to Poland. You're talking about the majority of Jewish existence? This is around, not even a hundred years after the Spanish Inquisition, everybody migrated to Poland. And they come and tell them, we've been feeding everybody, including, including you, if you're eating meat. Trefot, venevelo, dead animals. Now, he figured out, the Megale Mukot, why everybody was dying, why there was such a problem. The first thing that he did is he issued an a, a announcement. Everybody in the city must take all their vessels, plates, cups, pots, pans, break it to pieces. Don't ask questions right now. You take everything that you have in your kitchen. You don't kosher it. You don't boil it. You break it to pieces. And you don't touch anything that has to do with meat. You only eat parven dairy. You should upsuck everybody, the whole city. Nobody knows why the chief rabbi goes cuckoo now. Now they come and tell him, Rabbi, what are we going to do? Forget about that. You know, you're going to make everybody, okay, clean their, their, their kelim. But what are we going to do? What are we going to do? He tells them, I'm sorry to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. I don't think you can do tshuva. I think you are really doomed. You cannot do tshuva. And they're saying, Rabbi, must be something. Must be some loopholes. It has to be something that we can do tshuva. We're coming to do tshuva. He tells them, I don't know. I'm going to have to consult now with, with all the chief rabbis, all the great rabbis of the generation. He gathers all the great rabbis of the generation to an emergency meeting. And he brings these two brothers to tell the, the, the rabbis. And they come and they tell them what they did. And needless to say, all the rabbis are, are, are besides themselves. Angry, how dare you? And cursing them and, and going against them. You deserve the punishment. They don't know what to do. Galea Mukot says, I don't know. I don't know if you're going to have tshuva. And they're praying. They're begging, please, give us something. It must be that we have tshuva. There's no such a thing that we can't do tshuva. The Megalea Mukot tells them, listen, I'm going to give you tshuva. I'm going to tell you what you need to do. First of all, you're going to have to go into exile for three years. And I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to do. The first thing you need to do is you're going to have to go one synagogue after the other, one city after another, one village, another village. You're going to go through the entire country and you're going to go and start telling people what you did. Now you're going to throw all your fancy schmancy clothes. You're going to put rags on you. Bear in mind, these are gazillionaires. These are billionaires. They're the respectful people. He says, you're going to wear uh, schmatas on you, rags you're going to wear on you. You're going to burn all your properties. You cannot benefit from it because it was bought in a very wrong way. It was bought on money that is not kosher. You have to burn all your property. Can you imagine? A rich individual doesn't even have to burn everything, including your clothes. He says you're allowed to give your kids their clothes and some of their what belongs to them. To your wives, you can only give a little bit of things. And for you, you're going to burn all your stuff. All your property has to be burned down to ashes. Then, you're not allowed to eat the entire week. You're going to eat a little bit of piece of bread and a little bit of water. You have to fast the whole week. Bare minimum. Barely, barely eating. On Shabbat, you can eat a little bit. A little bit. Kazait. Just a little bit. More than that. You have to now become beggars. You're going to have to get charity to, to sustain yourself because you have to burn all your money. You can't keep anything. So you become now beggars. More than that, you're going to have to go now every day. You cannot stay in one time, town more than one day because you have to be in exile. 
You can't be comfortable. And every day you're going to go to a different town. And when you go to the different town, you're going to go in into the synagogue of that town. And after the prayer of Mincha, when everybody's in the synagogue, you're going to come and stand in the center of the synagogue and get everybody's attention. And you're going to start confessing. Telling everybody who you are, where you came from, what you did. And you're going to tell everybody what you did. You're going to confess and now you're going to have to beg for forgiveness from every person in that shul. You're going to have to beg for their forgiveness until they forgive you. And that's not all. When you're done, you're going to go out of the shul. You're going to lie down on the floor and they all have to step all over you as they're going out and spit in your face. And you're going to do that till you cover every village, every home, every synagogue, every town in the country of Poland. Till you're done. And you cannot stay one place more than one night. Then you have to, when you have free time, because you're only in the synagogues in the time of Mincha, you're going to go to the cemetery of that city and you're going to go and pray next to every grave because you don't know which one of them you killed with your sins and you're going to pray to all the graves to ask forgiveness for them. And you're going to go to all the graves of the tzaddikim to ask forgiveness for them. And you're going to pray all day long and you're going to have to really suffer. You're going to have to put yourself through suffering, through exile for three years. Now when you're done with three years, you come back to Krakow and you come back to see me. Now if you're lucky, I will still be alive. And then I will tell you how to continue your tshuva. And if I'm not alive, I will leave a note with my secretary that will have instructions for you what to do when you're done the three years. But the three years, to burn everything that you have, you're going to be beggars, you're going to apologize to everybody, you're going to suffer, you're going to be in exile, you're going to have to bring on yourself the most extreme suffering you can, not eating throughout the week, bare minimum. On Shabbat you're allowed to eat a kezait, you have to put yourself through tremendous suffering. The free time you're praying and you're doing tshuva. And then he lets them off. Okay. Three years later, on this perfect timing, on the exact day that the three years is over, of course they come back to Krakow. Dirty, neglected, old, wrinkled, stinky clothes. They look like they went through hell. Imagine every night you're in a different place, you don't have a home, to beg people to take you to sleep, beg people to give you food, beg people to give you some money. In Poland in the winter, snow, ice, rain, sometimes you're sleeping on the floor, sleeping with the, with the horses. I mean, they went through hell and a half in three years. When they come back, he greets them with great honor and great respect. Okay, now, they tell him, okay, now what do we do now? So they come to him and they tell him, listen, <laughs> with all the exile that we went through and everything that we suffered, we're still very afraid of our olam haba. Maybe our sins weren't forgiven. Maybe the tshuva was not accepted. So he tells them, so what do you want me to do? He says, they told him, we want you to sign a document that you saying that you are approving our tshuva and that our tshuva should be accepted and our sins should be forgiven. He says, okay, I, I will. He takes a, what's called a megillah, like a parchment, and starts writing down, me, achatu mata, the ones who signed below, rabbi, so and so, from the city of Krakow, and he writes down, and he says, I accept, I hereby declare that uh, their tshuva should be accepted, their sins should be forgiven, etc. Okay, time passed, and one of the partners became very, very ill. And he started dying in tremendous agony, pain, can't even imagine. Somebody would come and visit him uh, like, a, like a skeleton, dying in pain and sorrow and agony in his bed. And of course, crying from the fear. What's going to happen? Now I'm really dying. What's going to happen? Okay. So what did he say? I want you to get me that uh, letter. Bring me the letter. I need the letter of the, of the Magalaya Mukot. Okay. Of course, everybody came to see what's going on and he was afraid. The Magalaya Mukot came to see him and saw that he's dying in tremendous agony and pain. 
And he told him, take the letter, hold the letter with you, and we're going to bury you with the letter. You take this letter with you. Yeah. And then he made him uh, shake the hand with the partner, and he says, you are promising to your partner that after your death, you're going to come back to your partner in a dream, and you're going to tell him, first of all, exactly what happened to you as you were going out of your body, What's the result? Where are you going to have to come and report? Okay. And I'm really telling you the story, short version, by the way. You have to read the book. And to read the book, you, 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 you chills, tears. And, excuse me? Of course it's a real story. This is not a tale. This is a real, real story. Okay. So, and of course, the first partner dies. And they bury him. Now, in the, with, uh, with, uh, with the Megillah, with the page, Zion bears with that, with the, with the letter. He gave him uh, approval. I approve. Okay. They come to the funeral. Everybody comes to the funeral. And the Megillah Mukot, chief rabbi, gives the eulogy and says, Do you know who this man is? And he screams to the heavens, Open the gates of heavens. You don't know who, what tzaddik is coming now to the heavens. He did tshuva that we can't even fathom what type of, what level of tshuva he did. And he's talking just great on him. And how amazing what he took on himself, what suffering he took on himself, how he begged for tshuva, what, what, what a level of tshuva he was accepting on himself. Yeah, he ripped everybody's heart there. It was a eulogy that everybody was in tears. But mainly, he was praising him for the level of tshuva that he took. And then he says... Look at the power of tshuva. Real tshuva rips the heavens and goes all the way to the chair of glory. But you can only do tshuva as long as you have your soul. Kol od neshama bekirbo. As long as the soul is with you, you can do tshuva. Pshar la tshuva. The second you lose your soul, that's it. Time is over. Okay, they buried him and everybody went off to their home. Now the partner goes into anxiety. Now he's going to come to me in the dream and tell me what's going on. Waits one day, two days, a week, two weeks pass, no dream. He's now starting to get into more pressure and anxiety. Now what's going to happen? What are they doing to him up there? Three weeks pass, nothing. On the day of the Shloshim... He dreams of his friend. And in the dream, full of chills. In the dream, he sees his friend like a beam of light. For three years, all he saw his friends is in rags, dirty, reeks, dirty teeth, dirty nails. Suddenly he sees him. A beam of light. Light. Everything is light. He said he never saw his friend like that. Kodesh Elyon, supreme, exalted holiness. He couldn't even fathom what a kadosh, what a holy individual. And he's shocked. He doesn't know what to say when he sees his partner. And in the beginning, he couldn't even recognize. He thought maybe it's some saraf, some holy angel. He couldn't recognize that it's his partner. Just saw holy light. And then the partner tells him, let me tell you. And he's waiting to hear what is it doing to them up there. And the first thing the partner tells him, he says, Psh, you don't even know down there who's the Megalea Mukot. All the doors of the heavens are open for this guy. Any word that he says is accepted in Shemaim. You don't even know who this man is. You go and tell everybody who's the Megalea Mukot. Who's this rabbi? The entire heavens are bowing down to this great Neshama. All the doors of the heavens are open for him. Every word that he says is accepted in Shammai. And then he tells him all the story from how he left his body and what was going on. Go to the book and you read what he tells him, what he had to go through. So in one way, it's very scary when you read it. Now there's no time. I know you're all saying, <laughs> tell me, go to the book. Or maybe we'll read it another time when we have more time. Scary, what he had to go through. But at the same time, very, very calming, assuring, and happy. 
full of happiness. Because he told him exactly what he went, had to go through. That's scary. But what's the calming and promising and the happy part? That there is tshuva. The tshuva can reverse everything. Of course, his tshuva was accepted. He came to him like a kadosh elion, like a supreme, exalted, holy soul. The path up wasn't uh, the best path, but the end result was. And the end result was that the tshuva was accepted. Let's come to teach you exactly what the Megalea Mukot says. Kol zman neshama bekirbo yachol tshuva. As long as the soul is within you, you can still do tshuva. Doesn't matter what you did. And he quotes the verse, Kikarov elecha davar meod befiha uvilvavcha la soto. This is a verse in the book of Dvarim, chapter 30, verse 14. This thing is very close to you. It is in your mouth. It's in your heart. So that you can fulfill it. Everybody can do tshuva. You just have to understand the severity of what you did. You just need to understand that when the Torah comes and tells you that if you do certain sins and the punishment is karet, and if you do it deliberately and knowingly, there's almost no tshuva for that, that they had to go to a three-year exile, burn all their property, from being billionaires to become beggars, to be humiliated, insulted, hungry, starved, freezing cold, whatever. But they took on themselves tshuva. Because they understood that Olam Abba, this is not a joke. Your world to come, your eternity, this is not something you just give up for a hamburger. Or so some nonsense. Or one night of a, a fun with some young lady. Your Olam Abba is precious. Now when you don't understand what you're doing, that's one, one problem in itself. But you need to start... Opening your mind and your heart and your eyes to understand what am I doing in this world? But well, you think the Torah is a book of recommendations? The Torah comes and tells you straight out what you do, what you don't do. What's going to be the result when you don't do something? What's going to be the result when you do something? They figured that out. They figured it out and it shook them to the core that they were begging. Has to be tshuva. Has to be some type of a tshuva. Now the process of the partner going up wasn't so smooth. But it's not the process. It's the end result. The story goes on and on and on. But the moral that we want to take from that is first of all and most important, you got to be very aware of what you are doing. You got to learn what you're doing. You got to understand the severity of some of the damages that you do. And you have to internalize it in a way that it needs to shake you to the core. You need to be trembling from fear when you understand, wait a minute, when I lie, I slander, I do all sorts of things. The severity is not something to take so lightly, to ignore when you desecrate Shabbat, when you eat on Yom Kippur, whatever. We learned yesterday all the kretot. And obviously we're going to have to learn it even more to understand the severity and then how to do tshuva. But look at the moral. Kol zman neshama bekirbo efshar lasot tshuva. As long as the soul is within you, you can do tshuva. Vekarov elecha davar. And it's close to you. It's not something that you can do. Meod. Very. In your mouth and in your heart. What did we learn today with Rambam? First has to be in the heart. You have to make a, a strong decision. That's it. And after you make the strong decision and you stop, then then you talk. Then you come and start confessing and praying and learning. Now I don't look at the negative part of the story because the negative part... It's not so uh, pleasant to read or hear. Now listen. Look at the positive part of the story. Look what they did. Can you imagine what they did? We're going to learn a lot in the next, uh, well, I, I was about to say 40 days. We're already in the next 33 days. But we're going to learn, especially through many different books, what are the most severe sins. 
And one of them, we spoke about that many times, it's called Machti'ei Harabim, that you cause other people to sin. Mainly you sin, fine. Why are you doing it to other people? Why are you making other people sin? And these guys were Machti'ei Harabim. Sold Nevelot Vetrefot. Nevela is a dead animal. Trefa is an animal that was wounded and then it was killed. Now you maybe can start understanding why I've been telling you for the last year and a half, and more, by the way, most of the meat in our generation is not caught. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. You might be eating nevelot and trefot. This is, even, if you, even, even if it's by bishogeg, you still karet. You're still under the severity of karet because you ate a dead animal because it was packaged and you, the sizzling... Even Beshogeg. Even Beshogeg. And it's much more. It's not only the Nevelot and Trefot. There's many other things. But we need to internalize. Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. What am I playing here with? This is not that I'm playing here. I'm going to lose my vacation or not. Or my monthly bonus or not. This is your Abba. This is your Triat Emetim. The getting up with the dead at the time of Mashiach. But again, I'm choosing to look at the exciting part of the story, the comforting part of the story, the light of the story, that there is tshuva, even for them. Can you imagine? The, good, the book goes into details. 20, 30, 40 years feeding the entire city and the entire country. Nevelot vetrefot. Every bar mitzvah, every wedding. Every siyum shas, every anything, every shulzat shabbat, all the food, all the rabbis, all everybody eating trefot because of them. They're thinking they're doing great. Can you imagine? Now, I don't think neither one of us is in that level. Unless you have something to tell me. But even if we're not in that level, even if it's 1% of that... When I saw this the first time, it shook me to the core to understand, wait a minute. This is not a joke. What was I doing for 15 years? Wearing a suit and a yarmulke and a beard. That's not tshuva. What's my tshuva? That I stopped lying, that I stopped cheating, that I started eating kosher, I started observing Shabbat and putting filling. That's tshuva. That's not tshuva. You know what's tshuva? is that your kishkes from inside cannot stand the fact that you were able to do such a thing. Regret and remorse that you can't live with yourself for the fact that you did such horrible things. That's tshuva. Not that you put a yamaka on your head and you put filin on. That's a commandment that you have to do. But to feel horrible for what you did, now you're talking. Now you have to take that and internalize this what I've been doing in the last 20 years, this is uh, children's games. Doesn't sound good in English. In Hebrew, it's Mishak Yiladim. This is a, how do you say, child's, child's play. Real tshuva is you have to understand the damage you caused yourself, other people, the master of the universe, and not to be able to fall asleep at night. To say, I, 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 then to take on yourself serious tshuva, serious tshuva. Now, I'm not telling you to go to exile for three years, but you take on yourself serious tshuva. You cut off any type of benefit, pleasure, whatever you can take from this world, you take the tshuva to your next level. You do whatever you want at the end of the day. I'm just telling you what I'm thinking, what, I'm, what I can give over. And again, I don't look at this story as a horrible, scary, disgusting, frightening story. I'm looking at it as the, the, the ticket to the Olam Abba, The ultimate hope one can have. That even Rashaim like that, this is a true story, but this is not a tale. This is not a parable. This is not some Hollywood script. This is a true story told by the Megalea Mukot. I'm telling you, if you just want to start tasting who is the Megalea Mukot, take one of his books. Read. What a... What, what a what a tzaddik. He tells this story. And you know how he called them? Kedoshi Elon. He called them holy individuals. They were able to do tshuva. 
Can you imagine what a nachat for the rabbi to see that they're taking on themselves that type of tshuva? He told them, I don't know if your tshuva will be accepted. I can't guarantee anything. Even though after that he wrote down some type of a recommendation letter, which obviously did something in the heavens. So what we want to take from this is a verse that has to be echoing in your ears. Kol zman aneshama bekervo yachol asot tshuva. As long as your soul is in your body, you can do tshuva. End the story. And we'll add another verse to that. This is not something that is intangible. It's not something that is unfathomable. It's not something that you can't do. It all depends if you want to do it. If you don't want to, don't. <laughs> That's where I say goodbye. But if you want to, you can do it. <laughs> you want to. Trust me. You don't want to leave this room tonight without wanting to. Now to bring yourself to the point that you can't sleep at night because you're so heartbroken for what you did, work on it. But Hashem has gave us a gem. A, 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 I told you in the morning. Or what did I tell you? A lottery ticket. You won the lottery. That Hashem is even willing to give you the chance to do tshuva. Go out to the street now, and I can point out at least 50 people like that, that they're not accepted yet to do tshuva. Walking in the streets, like, everything's fine. We're going back to our normal schedule in a few months, said BB and the World Health Organization. Living in some Goonie land, La La Land, whatever. No, everything will be fine. They found the vaccine. It's going to be good. Yeah. Yeah, everything's going to be fine. You eat whatever you want, sleep whatever you want, talk whatever you want, do whatever you want. Let's eat and drink today. How many people you see in the street that their mind is so sealed, blocked? They don't even get it. Now you're sitting here right now. You get it. Which means that you were handed out a lottery ticket, a winning lottery ticket, by the master of the universe that says, I'm willing to let you do tshuva. The gates of tshuva are open for you. I don't know about him, him, and him. Now what did we learn an hour ago? What the Ramak says in Tomer Dvorah? Don't just look at yourself. You see somebody else. Ooh, it has to be painful for you to see another person eating out there a cheeseburger. Or desecrating Shabbat or whatever it is. It has to pain you from inside that you know and he doesn't. That you have the opportunity to Juma and he doesn't yet. It has to rip you from inside. And more than that, you have to be jumping from joy, thanking the master of the universe at least, at least once every hour for letting you do Juma. I'm not joking. Minimum 10, 20 times a day with your own words, thank you. Toda! And then, you know, action speaks much louder than words. Do something to show the master of the universe how much you appreciate the fact that he's allowing you to do tshuva. If he wouldn't allow you to do tshuva, the switch is turned off, and you back to your old you. For whatever amount of time that that will sustain. You do the tshuva, but the Kadosh Buhu also allows you to do it and helps you. If you need to take at least one thing out of this class, is gratitude to the master of the universe that he's even allowing you to have some type of common sense, some type of understanding that you can do something. How many people die without tshuva? And again, don't just, I, I hope you're not taking this class, but oh, this is scary. It has nothing to do with scary. It, it, first of all, it better be scary. This is not a, I, 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 don't, I actually don't get it how sometimes people sweeten everything and cushion everything and, and don't worry, Shem loves us. So, so what? I love my kids too. So when they go off their path, I'm not going to educate them. We just spoke like an hour ago how much it hurts the, the Kadosh Baruch to punish us. But doesn't mean the job needs to be done. But I'm, I'm choosing only to see the opportunity, the love, the kindness, the, the way to do tshuva for everything. 
So if you think that you really messed up, think twice because some other people messed it up on a global scale. And I know everybody, everybody here has a story. I also have a few stories. We all have something. It doesn't matter. Anything. Anything can be switched. Anything can be transformed. Sweetened. I mostly see here the unbelievable opportunity that Kadosh Baruch gives us to make amends with my own behavior. And do it. Do it fast. You don't have a lot of time. May Hashem accept our tshuva. May Hashem open the gates of tshuva for everyone. Not only for us. And may Hashem help us awaken as many people as possible for them to have the opportunity to do tshuva. And Hashem open our hearts and our minds and our eyes to understand the great opportunity to fix what we did in our past. And most important that He may accept our tshuva that the tshuva should be accepted, that our sins should be erased, that the record should be completely deleted, and then we will win Chaye Olam Abba. We will gain the life, the eternal life, to be, um, be amongst these holy souls. And may Hashem not only accept our tshuva, allow to make the entire nation to do tshuva. Bezad Hashem, accept our prayers and me ten. It should be a should be a, a will. Yiratzon shagadosh b'chu is the kenu lasot shuvah mitit lifanav. They should merit us to do real, real shuvah from umkel ediba medelibad from the depth of our heart, and we should shake the heavens with our shuvah. And then once you get that done, don't forget that there are many souls out there that they don't even know what's going on. They're completely under some type of uh, tardema, under anesthesia, some sleeping. And it's in our job to go and shake people, to wake people up. You see a person sin, don't, don't judge them. Oh, look, oh, oh. Develop compassion. Come to your dear friends and why, why are you doing that? Oh, it's, not, it's not the will of the Kadosh Baruch Don't do that. We have a lot to do. Hayom katsar melacha merubah. The day is short and we have a lot what to do, so get started. <laughs>